to, to, to learn and, and to play. And so, Aaron, if you are looking for a place to practice in Canada, we can have a discussion at the conclusion of, uh, of, of this workshop. Um, it's also important for me to, I suppose, in some sense, declare what might be potential conflicts or not conflicts, but relationships. So for many years, I have been involved in sport medicine. I was, um, I still serve as a member of the uh, Medical Council of the International Basketball Association. I'm chair of the Canadian Soccer Association Sport Medicine Committee, both of which I suppose reflect a, a lifelong involvement in both sports, which also included um, representing somewhat erratically at this university in intercollegiate competition. Um, and, and so it's been a particular privilege to have the ability to remain involved in sport at, at this level. And, and it, of course, it brings a, a certain perspective and a certain reality to the discussions. Um, and, and to do that, I would just contextualize the challenge, particularly as it relates to the global challenge to address this issue. Um, I just returned from Qatar 48 hours ago uh, from the International Athletic Amateur Athletic Federation's World Championships with 2,000 of the world's elite track and field athletes, 40% of whom have never seen a physician. So on a global basis, this allows us to understand the, the, the dimensions and nature of this challenge. But of course, we're here today to discuss how we in a national context can, can begin to uh, apply um, our knowledge in, in a way so as to, to prevent the, the catastrophes which we all seek to, seek to avoid. The challenge that I have today is, is made more difficult in as much that it's very difficult to follow a presentation as cogent, as cohesive, and as erudite as that which Dr. Bagish has just provided. So thank you for, for so thoughtfully and so completely uh, laying the background for, for our discussions today. Uh, and it's no small honor to be able to share a podium with someone who is uh, so esteemed in, 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 this whole, in this whole area. But my challenge is, or not challenge, my task, pardon me, is to relate to you the work that has been undertaken in Canada by the Canadian Cardiovascular Society and a group of which many of you are a member in terms of developing guidelines for the screening of competitive athletes in, in Canada, which has we would all acknowledge can be a particular challenge for the sport medicine professional who may must be familiar with the common causes of, of, of this catastrophe, uh, but sensitive to the new and sensitive to the nuances of their presentation. And our work culminated in the publication of this Canadian Cardiovascular Society position statement published in December in the Canadian Journal of, of Cardiology. And there are a whole array of assumptions that underlie thinking of, about cardiovascular screening of athletes. And many of those have already been identified uh, by Dr. Bagish, and I so won't, won't uh, repeat them. And given that you can all read far more rapidly than I can speak, um, I draw your attention to the information that's on this slide. And these are assumptions that are, are, are very persistent uh, and very often reveal startling misconceptions. So some background considerations that informed and influenced our decision, uh, and notwithstanding the important reminder that depending upon the population that you examine, the incidence of this phenomenon may differ quite dramatically. Ultimately, I think there is overall, from a community perspective, an, an incidence rate of approximately one per 100,000, notwithstanding the subtext to that kind of statement that were so uh, appropriately identified for us this morning, which Always, though, when these events occur, and they are so devastating, that they prompt the kind of questions that, that, are, are, that appear uh, on the base of, of this screen this morning. You've already heard about the current guidelines from the AHA, subsequently uh, have uh, more thought, uh, more revisions have been undertaken. And we also understand the European guidelines and their emanation from Italy, and very specifically, uh, a concern about sudden cardiac death, which reflected a very high rate of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy in the northeastern region, the Veneto region uh, of Italy. Also important for us as Canadians to recognize that there are no, a couple of areas in Canada, most specifically in, in Newfoundland, where there are populations that have a very high risk of sudden cardiac death. And it's important to always keep that in mind. Um, our discussions, I suppose, began with an editorial which we published in the, in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology, which sort of made the, the point that, look, in Europe, there's this perspective, and in, in the United States, there's this perspective, and Canada, which prides itself upon being mid-Atlantic culturally and so many other ways, um, we didn't really have any kind of statement whatsoever. So where did we stand? Um, and that also um, 
was our, our, our thinking was influenced by this publication, some of you are in the audience this morning, that looked at what was happening actually in the Canadian collegiate environments insofar as these issues were concerned. And we found, once again, as is consistent and common in, in many of these studies, that there was widespread variability in terms of what was being performed in Canadian university or college in environments. Similarly, there was a considerable disconnect in terms of what was being done insofar as the availability of automatic defibrillators, the presence of emergency action plans in a variety of varsity environments. So these underlay our, our thought and our discussion. Uh, and we identified a, a number of, of, of questions that influenced any of these discussions, capacity, cascades of follow-ups, false positives, all of which have, have been identified by, by Dr. Baggage. There were, however, some important considerations. One is that in contrast, if, you, if I may, to our neighbors just across the lake, we have a very different health system. And for many NCAA athletes, their first ever contact with a medical system is their contact with their team physician. Uh, and so we thought this was not an unimportant consideration given that so many athletes appearing in Canadian universities, Canadian colleges would already throughout their lifespan have been involved with pediatricians, primary care physicians, et cetera, et cetera. So things like family history, much greater contact with the medical uh, uh, system in, in our context. Uh, and then the normal, the normal kind of considerations about the value of ECGs and the accuracy of interpretation followed. Uh, and the group that ultimately assembled adopted a grade approach to evaluate for, to establishing or validating or evaluating, pardon me, um, the studies that were, were um, uh, extant at this point. We also wanted to be perfectly clear that our guidelines were designed to focus on at the level of the varsity competitive athlete. Um, and I think once again, we've seen so eloquently presented this morning the fact that that's a population that is particularly at perhaps at greater risk as their dose of, of exercise or physical activity increases sub, um, substantially. We were also aware of this publication by Sasha Batcha, who's a women's college hospital, I, I believe, um, epidemiologist, cardiologist, who pointed out that when we're talking about screening, it's very important to understand that there are some principles that underlie screening that have been well documented and published and, and, and available for some time. Uh, and those three elements are, are listed on this slide. It has to be common, there has to be a cost effective way of screening, um, and it must lead to an intervention that ultimately will reverse that which you are uh, attempting to, uh, the consequences of that which you are attempting to, uh, to identify. Uh, and so we can continue to address these kinds of assumptions. Well, is screening of athletes sensitive? Generally, it can't be said to be so. Does it have a few false positives? Generally, it doesn't. Is it practical? It's complicated. It depends upon where in the cross, at the crossroads, uh, to, use, to repeat that uh, analogy, uh, you particularly stand. And the results may not lead to action. Uh, and these are all limitations of these kinds of approaches, which is important to understand, particularly, finally, is there evidence that such approaches lead to reduced events? And there's no substantial evidence to support that. As we began our, our discussions, we decided that we would develop um, an institution-centered approach. And, and here, I think, remarkably similar to the, pers to the uh, perspective that's been shared, that's extant in, in, among our American colleagues, that institutions can choose, they can vary their approach, but fundamentally access to AEDs, having emergency access, um, emergency plans, et cetera, et cetera, are the foundation upon which any of, uh, and all of our recommendations should, should, uh, should follow. Um, Queen's University graduates are, are noted for being incredibly chauvinistic. We bleed red, blue, and gold. Um, and so it's important that I demonstrate that chauvinism to you with a, a visual representation of our university at that point. And um, the other Im important point is that in that university setting, be it Queen's or otherwise, this foundation, this tiered approach, as represented by this diagram, is a very useful way of planning and delivering the kind of interventions and the kind of processes that, that we recommend. That is, there has to be that foundation, and as you go up, you may choose to do other things, at the top of the list being an adjunct ECG.
So the first recommendation was this incremental approach to the cardiovascular screening of competitive athletes. And that tiered approach should take place in the context of a consistent systematic approach to cardiovascular care. And while we did not recommend against ECGs, we did not recommend it as part and parcel of blanket screening. Uh, once again, reflecting the, the concept that institutions can choose to do with what, what they feel most appropriate in their particular context. Now, our process uh, also included the participation of external um, authorities, and, and we are very, very fortunate that Dr. Bagish was one of those individuals, Sanjay Jarma, who is known to many of us, also provided a perspective from, from uh, the United Kingdom. Um, and Dr. Bagish's comments was that you're downplaying the value of screening. This may be the only health care that they get, um, which speaks to the point that in our system, that is not necessarily, well, almost fundamentally not, not the case. Whereas Dr. Sharma said, well, you're downplaying the value of the ECG and the history and the physical should not rank above that. But nonetheless, we felt that the tiered approach did not mean that we were downplaying it, but we had a realistic perspective on when and where and how such should be applied. So the second recommendation related to the fact that there should be a history and questionnaire as the fundamental part of the screening using recognized instruments in, in this particular respect, four of which were identified in, in our document, but that that questionnaire should be appropriately administered and more importantly, appropriately interpreted. Uh, and at the risk of opening interprofessional wounds, it is not appropriate for a chiropractor to be responsible for the pre-participation care of athletes. And, and, and I, I'm sorry if I offend some in that, in that context, I suspect most of us are aware of why that's an, an appropriate perspective. It's also important to note that athletic therapists in Canada and for the most part in the United States are not regulated or recognized health disciplines. And, and there have been a number of, of significant litigious events occurring in the United States in the collegiate system as a consequence of that recognition and the consequence of, of the, of the um, activities that ha have occurred on, on occasion uh, it, it, by virtue of in, in that respect. So William Osler was arguably the, 20, the greatest physician of the 20th century, although he graduated from Canada's other Scottish university, McGill. Um, and those of you who are not from Canada may not be aware that the rivalry between McGill and Queens is universal ongoing, um, et cetera, et cetera. So another chauvinistic poke, poke. But listen to your patient, he's telling you the diagnosis. And, and of course that's great as long as people take a history or look carefully and listen. And that is not always the case. This is a young woman who played four years of basketball in the NCAA before she presented to our institution with a ruptured aorta. Nobody had ever recognize this individual's clinical condition, which I suspect all of you, the moment the slide appeared on, on the screen, understood uh, what was uh, the pathological background here. And all of, the only purpose of showing this slide is because A, this young woman has insisted that anytime I talk anywhere about this topic that I show this slide. She also asked that I not mask her face because she wanted to be known as the person that had had this particular incident but I, I neglected that, in, that instruction. But I think it points out to the limitations of the approaches that we would propose given the idiosyncrasies or the circumstances of particular professionals or particular institutions. Um, so we recommended that a physical examination should be an adjunct component of cardiovascular screening based on the findings of that, of that screening. And there, it's fundamentally important to be performed by an appropriately qualified professional and followed up uh, appropriately. We did not recommend the routine performance, but we did not prohibit it. Uh, and we recommended that if a 12 lead ECG is to be applied to an athlete's examination, it should be of adequate quality. It should not be faxed four times, photocopied twice, and then passed on to somebody and asked to be read. It should be interpreted by those who have experience in dealing with the ECGs of, of accomplished athletes or athletes exposed to significant training, given the multiple characteristics of an athlete that appear typically on, on most ECGs, which are very often misinterpreted. And it should be accompanied by appropriate investigations and expert referral if there are, are findings on, on that, from that instrument.
So that those basically are the crux of, of our recommendations. Uh, and the values that underlay those recommendations are noted here on this particular slide. Um, the whole question of the incidence of sports-related sudden cardiac death, I think, has been uh, very completely discussed already this morning, and, and I won't dwell. But again, we wanted to examine and to, to question some of, of some of the assumptions, noting that screening has to be sensitive, have few false positives, practical, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also looked at some of the uh, characteristics of, of ECGs in athletes, and one discovers very quickly that there is a very substantial and significant racial bias in terms of, of the interpretation of ECGs. And those of us that are involved in international sport understand that af particularly athletes from Africa, Northeastern Africa, et cetera, have very, very different ECGs than is the case with, with, with Caucasians, important considerations. Issues of inter-observer variability also uh, are an important component of any of these kinds of uh, discussions. Um, and, and also trying to understand what the true incidence is in our population. And, and here, uh, the paper by Dr. Landry from Dr. Dorian's group, uh, I think was um, of significant interest. This is a very unique study which involves an examination of all of the ambulance records over a five-year period who attended cardiac events in a huge metropolitan, multicultural, multi-ethnic community, which is metropolitan Toronto, uh, and, and assess the nature of those cardiac events. Um, and what one identified ultimately was of the 16 cardiac deaths that occurred in athletic settings, only one to three of those individuals with the diagnosis, which was subsequently confirmed at autopsy, uh, could have been identified via screening underscoring the challenge of screening programs. And this study from, by Malhotra in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at 16, uh, pardon me, almost uh, just slightly more than 11,000 athletes who were participants in the Premier League football academies in the United Kingdom. These were young individuals, young athletes who had histories, ECGs, echocardiograms, and were subsequently followed. And ultimately, eight of those such individuals experienced sudden death. But in six of those eight individuals, no abnormality was detected whatsoever in terms of those very thorough kind of uh, examinations. Um, I couldn't help but, if I may digress for a second, uh, I was asked yesterday or the day before, would I please write a letter to, to CONCACAF, which is the regional element of FIFA, explaining why we are not doing echocardiograms on our under 17 team, which we're sending to the CONCACAF championships. Um, and I hear, I think it's very important that we understand that sometimes international federations um, impose standards which are, and they do so in a manner of a way which is unthinking. Um, and I know that we will write an erudite letter explaining why we're not doing it, while the vast majority of the members of the CONCACAF family will turn up at that tournament from countries where there's absolutely no capacity to regularly administer echocardiograms on, on elite or semi-elite uh, uh, young players. So there are some challenges in that respect, but I digress, let me get back. Um, from Dr. Landry's paper, we'd know we'd have to screen 400,000 individuals to prevent the one or two who are destined to die. Um, and in Malhotra, uh, we saw that only, um, uh, only, pardon me, only uh, uh, six of, two of the, uh, one to two of the, uh, the eight who died would have been identified by, by screening. Uh, more evidence comes from our Norwegian colleagues who point out that comprehensive screening does not identify uh, players who may be prone to subsequent cardiovascular incidents. Very important to contextualize this, play, this paper because it looks at athletes older uh, than perhaps the, the, the collegiate population and coronary artery disease figured prominently in that series. So as we, Moved on in our process, we, or we began uh, to emphasize the importance of shared decision-making when incidents or, or, or when uh, cases emerge in order that uh, the choice about how to proceed further can be made by all involved, the athlete, family, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and, recognize, and we recognize the value of that shared decision-making process and the steps which have been described elsewhere. Um, 
Finally, we, we gave very specific recommendations as to which conditions should result in the exclusion of an, of an individual from competitive sport. And I think there would be uh, widespread agreement about, about those, uh, those disease states or, or pathologies that, that are found on this list. We also emphasized, and I'm repeating, the importance of, of a planned approach to the management of CV uh, emergencies by institutions and organizations, that there need to be widespread availability of defibrillators, education of personnel and maps, um, and that all in, in individual institutions had policies and protocols specific to those, those aims and, and those in, intents. Uh, just a, a quick comment of, about the validity of, of recognizing and acting quickly. Um, the use of, of mobile defibrillators to respond to cardiac events occurring during road races um, can be looked at in the context from a, an optimal approach by what happens in Japan, where there are specially trained teams of individuals on bicycles who are present at major, major road racing events. Uh, and in publishing their, their experience, they note that 100% of those individuals who collapsed in varying com competitions uh, promptly identified and promptly defibrillated had return of spontaneous circulation and, and a favorable neurological outcome. In contrast to the data that, that is found in, in other settings or in other centers where an on-site AED can produce 93% neurologically intact survival rates, I'm talking about athletic centers, athletic environments, whereas those that don't have such um, devices available have an abysmally poor 9% survival rate. So our recommendations were particularly strong in, in that particular area. Uh, and also we made the point that individuals who most typically identify these issues tend to be coaches and officials. And so specific attention can usefully be made to ensuring that referees and coaches have an understanding of the phenomena of the non-traumatic spontaneous collapse um, I feel very old here this morning because when talking about cardiac events which have galvanized the cardiovascular community into action, uh, I go back a lot further and I remember the horrible story of Hank Gathers who collapsed in a nationally, tele I believe it was one of the first nationally televised NCAA basketball games and who collapsed wide motionless at center court. Um, and what is, I think, perhaps an untold story, and it may be apocryphal, but I don't think so in terms of talking to, to colleagues um, in, in, with, with uh, some familiarity with the situation. There was an AED tucked behind a bench courtside. And the physician at that match was unfortunately an orthopedic surgery resident who'd been asked by his senior to, would you go, you get your chance to go watch a basketball game, blah, 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 blah. And the opportunity to, or the facility with and the apprehension that surrounded a nationally televised event in a massively filled stadium led to the unfortunate delays. In fact, a defibrillator was never deployed in that particular case. And that, that galvanized attention, but that was decades ago. Um, and still we, we have the dilemma where systematically we have not got defibrillators in place with people who know how to use them in accordance with appropriate uh, medical training, training plans. Um, so our approach was sequential, it was tiered, appreciated the... So a few months ago, Dr. Jury asked me if I might be interested in attending and telling you about Jordan's story. So really, and, and the work we've been doing since his passing. So really, I guess we're here is just a practical example of, of what you're talking about uh, uh, here today. And uh, um, so if you indulge me, I'd like to talk to you about uh, 